Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jussi Oms, director and founder of Talking Galleries, the think tank for galleries based in Barcelona. I'm delighted to be here at ARCO with all of you in such a special edition for the fair this year, because it celebrates its 40th anniversary, and also because we are able to come together again in what is the major meeting point for the art market in Spain. I want to thank Maria Lopez and the ARCO team very much for inviting us to take part in the public program and prepare today's talk. We're excited to be hosting these talks face to face after a long year with practically no in-person meetings. On our event in the Barcelona Symposium, usually held in January, is planned for early October this year. Talking Galleries is a think tank dedicated to generating debate and knowledge around gallery practices and the art market. In these uncertain times, we are committed to analyzing the impact of the current pandemic on this industry and the challenges that it faces. The subject which brings us together here is precisely the art fairs. The last year was marked by uncertainty, cancellations, and virtual initiatives. Despite this, the art world has confirmed that fairs will continue to be an important part of the industry. You just have to see how well ARCO is performing these days. However, there are challenges in order to adapt to the changing times. Today's program, called Art Fairs in Times of Change, consists of four talks. We aim to rethink the role of fairs in the art ecosystem that will emerge from the crisis derived from the pandemic. What are the challenges that the fairs face in the post era COVID? How do we adapt to accelerated digitization of the artistic experience? What fairs do galleries need? And what fair model do we want for the future? To tackle on these and other issues, we are proud to have the contribution of a distinctive group of art professionals, both from Spain and abroad. Many thanks to the speakers and moderators for joining us on this occasion. Melanie, even if that means in a virtual mode, the hybrid model is here to stay, I would say. And now let's start with the discussions. Let me introduce the first panel that will focus on how fairs are facing the digital challenge. It will be moderated by Montse Badia, a Spanish historian, art critic and creator of exhibitions based in Barcelona. She is also co-founder and director of ADESC, a platform dedicated to critical thinking in contemporary art. Monse, the floor is yours. <laughs> thanks a lot. First of, all, uh, first of all, thanks a lot to, to Arco, to Maribel López for organizing these talks, to Yusia and to Sol García from Talking Galleries, and to our panelists here for joining us in, in this discussion. So we are, as you just said, we are living a very interesting times, as the blessing attribute to Chinese culture would say. Uh, Non-interesting would be calm and quiet. Interesting means travel and, and new challenges all the time. So this uh, makes sense to discuss about it. So we are going to discuss what's happening in real time. So, uh, last year, according to the data of the economist Claire McAndrew, before the pandemic, there were 300 international established art fairs. So, it's not a wonder that we were talking about fair uh, fatigue. Fair fatigue or fair tick directly was a new term that appeared. We, all of us, we experienced this. At the same time, there were some external trends that, uh, that uh, were coming, uh, were becoming an issue and has been very, very present with the pandemic, like the um, 
environmental concerns. The fact of the fares implies a lot of people traveling, a lot of uh, use of uh, really plastic material and so on. Now is really a, a big concern with all the consequences. The shutdown in 2020 obliged us uh, to stay at home, but at the same time, I think accelerated a kind of panic not to be visible. And the consequence was that was a kind of online hyperactivity. All the time there were exhibitions to see online, panels to attend, discussions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. At this point, I think that now we are all of us a little bit uh, exhausted of, of creating our TV sets at home and to have only the, the screen, the socializing only through the screens. So I think this year, 2021, is a kind of transitional year. Uh, it's really very brave from Arco to really be uh, stubborn enough to, to make this fair happen in this moment. And also, uh, it uh, makes us aware of what has been happening a little bit. I mean, it's a year of uh, try and error in a way, no? We have been all these viewing rooms online. We have seen performance at the same time for a very limited uh, audience. We have seen talks, pa talks and panels that are half recorded, half via Zoom, like this is the case with Melanie in London and we here, or uh, totally in presence. We have also seen how, uh, in this case, uh, fairs with booths, with the wars, but not with the galleries. That was the case of our Basel in Hong Kong this year. And we have seen also some, um, some boundaries that are blurring, like uh, in between uh, joint ventures between galleries and auction houses. So it's a moment of really uh, try and test and see where we are and we can work and how. So as you see, I said, how the art fairs are facing the digital challenge is the issue of uh, to discuss in this panel. Our three guests have uh, very different positions, but more than position experiences. And I think this can bring a lot of interesting discussions and light in this issue we are we are going to, to analyze now. So I'm happy and honored to present. Uh, I start with uh, Melanie Gerlis. Uh, hello, Melanie. Melanie is an art market contributor of Financial Times since 2016. Previously, she was editor at large at the art newspaper, reporting on auctions, art fairs, and market news globally since 2007. Before entering the art world, Melanie worked for 10 years at Finsbury, a strategic communication and investment relations firm, advising investment uh, banks, hedge funds, and, and other financial services clients. Melanie has a BA in English Literature from Cambridge University and an MA uh, in Art Business from Sotheby's Institute of Art in London and is a trustee of the Art Academy and Art uh, 360 and member of the governing body for Sotheby's Institute of Art. Uh, her book, Art as an Investment, a Survey of Comparative Assets, was published uh, by Lan Humphries in 2014. And her new book that will be soon released this year, we will talk about it, with the title The Art Fair Story, A Roller Coaster Ride. So we are looking forward to know more from this book that will, uh, will be very interesting for our, for our debate. Our second guest is Thomas Schulte, director of the Thomas Schulte Gallery in Berlin. The gallery is celebrating 30 years now, which uh, means something in, in this moment. At the beginning of the 80s, uh, the dissertation of Thomas Schulter, uh, The Window as Pictorial Motive in the Works of Jan Farmer van Delft, brought uh, Thomas Schulter to New York, where very soon he had an internship in the Museum of Modern Art and quickly took the position on a special consist, uh, consultant in the position of assistant curator. Was director of the John Weber Gallery in New York until 1990, and uh, in 1991 he opened a gallery with his partner Eric Frank in Berlin. The gallery Frank and Schulter was one of the new galleries in Berlin immediately after the German reunification. In 2000, the gallery uh, uh, took his actual name, name Gallery Thomas Schulte. And uh, is working with artists like Gordon Mata Clark, Angela de la Cruz, Hamish Fulton, Rebecca Horn, 
uh, some uh, fantastic pieces are now in the booth of this year of this edition of Arco uh, and soon is opening in the gallery in Berlin an exhibition with Maria Loboda and Lawrence Wiener the next week and Thomas Schulter is a committee member of the art fairs Art Basel, Artissima Bologna, Arco, Armory Show and member, founding member of Art Forum Berlin. Our third guest is uh, Pablo Rodriguez Fraile. He's a digital asset investor and art patron. Based in Miami, Pablo is an investor with focus on digital assets and blockchain technology. His digital art collection that together has with uh, his wife, Denise Cassoni, is widely regarded as the most important collection in the world. And recently, Pablo got uh, a lot of media attention because in relation to the use of the non-fungible tokens applied to the artworks, and also because of the record price of a piece by the artist Beeple sold in auction in, in Christie's. So already with this presentation, uh, we see that the, the conversation can happen up in, in many ways. So I would like, I think it's important to know where we are going. It's important to know where we are and to know the present, to uh, know where we come from the past. So I would start with Melanie and uh, as, as a kind of teaser of your new work, the Art Fair Story a ro Roller Caster Ride. I would like to ask you a kind of, uh, brief, compressed uh, analysis of the evolution of our first to understand where are we now. Thank you, Monse, and I hope you can all hear me um, all right. Thank you for having me uh, remotely. Just uh, Can you put thumbs up to tell me you can hear me? Yes, perfectly well. Yes, wonderful, wonderful. Um, yes, thank you, and how, how fascinating to, do, to be so hybrid. Um, but yes, thank you for putting a bit of a plug for my book here. I mean, I think the first thing to say is that we're primarily talking about the contemporary and modern art market and contemporary and modern art fairs, because that was where there was the greatest need to promote and also the greatest supply of work, which are two good combinations. And my book um, looks back at a very, very broad trajectory geographically. So it starts in continental Europe, in the 1960s, this is the post-war time, and, and you know, in Spain, a little after, we have the post um, post Franco time, which is when everyone really needed, had a real desire to modernise. And contemporary art was quite a good way of showing the new world and other culture as well. We saw it in music um, and film as well. So the book goes from continental Europe, and then it follows the wealth really. I mean, that is the history of the art fairs and the history of the art market. Um, so it, I go to the US in the 1980s. We then move to the UK through the late 90s and across the millennium. Um, and then goes, so we're going, we're going nice and east. It then goes to Asia in the 2010s. And then, as we know, art fairs were everywhere. And exactly as you said, Monty, I mean, that there was a point when there were actually 365 art fairs. Um, and then from everywhere, we went to nowhere. Um, so I just, I look at the whole, I look at the history. There are two things really that, that primarily that emerged while I was writing, um, the book. Um, I think the first is that, that that trajectory is not, it's not an upward graph of growth by any stretch of the imagination. There have been hiccups and problems the whole way through. So there was a huge downturn just in the run up to the 1990s and through most of the 1990s. Um, we had 9-11 in 2001, which is a huge terrorist attack in New York. Um, and then, of course, another economic downturn more recently that, that maybe most of us remember. So COVID, in a way, is just another blip. It's another hiccup, another bump in the in the roller coaster. Um, but what happened every time there was a hiccup is that art fairs had to adapt in some way. And now, you know, the need is still the same. Okay, people still need to create, to make this market function. We still need to create a desire for contemporary art as mon and, and modern art among as many people as possible. But now there are more ways to create that desire. There are different sorts of art. There are different sorts of mechanisms. And the business models w will change. I mean, I know we're going to talk about this uh, in more detail, but I, you know, fairs, there will be fewer fairs and they will be less dominant. Like every part of the art market will be less dominant. So I hope that's a, a good summary for you. <laughs> Thank you for the effort of this compression. 
<laughs> we come back to later to to more details. I would like to also address a question to to Thomas Schulte because as a statement of your gallery uh, is a very very nice and and rigorous statement and and links really to the art and the artist. The statement of the gallery is. We stand for substantial concept-based art that resonates with the present and is relevant for the future. For this, we create the best possible context out of an honest understanding of our artists and collectors. This is a statement. I would like uh, how you live these uh, strange uh, moments of shutdown the last year and how you see uh, your colleagues, artists, collectors, galleries, uh, how they have lived this situation and what is the, the how they what is their perspective from what happened and how can develop? <clears throat> well, you ask a lot of questions, which are um, in themselves would need a lot of time to answer. Uh, first of all, I have to say it seems that I'm the only one who comes out of what you would call the old art world. I'm the only one here who is not primarily interested in economic aspects of the art market, which I was a little bit shocked to hear right now. I've been living through the last 30 years, 35, 37 years, as part of the art world. And I've seen the art world shift to something that has become uh, reigned by a global commodity thinking market that um, sees the beauty in numbers, not on the, the aspect of mathematical beauty, but under the aspect of the beauty of making a lot of money. Creating markets is something that was not necessarily what I was brought up with. I was brought up with creating content. And content is what art can provide. And with everything that has been set up to now, there has been very little said about content, and that will be the one thing uh, that is important. So when I came into the situation last March, I can agree with what she said, that it was just another bump in the road for me. If you have been in this market for 35 years, you have seen so many different uh, situations that have to be mastered that um, I was grateful that I had been there. So um, it was still like sailing full with full sails into a fog, dense fog. And uh, it was still something that you had never really seen before. So everything had to be reevaluated. Re there was a lot that had to uh, be done without meeting people. And so for us, it was um, coming, for sh coming from very short-term plans to going to long-term thinking. Mm -hmm. If you ask me now, what was the time like, then I can only say I'm really not that interested anymore what it was like. I'm interested how I'm going to be able to react to the future. And um, so we learned a lot about that. We learned a lot about alternative ways of communication. We got ourselves um, good help, and we had been preparing for a while in terms of our uh, uh, digital uh, um, communication and digital outreach, etc. So, um, however, I have to say that one of the things that caught us was, and caught many of my bigger colleagues at the end of the year, was that we were too much ground focused at that point. And so, uh, to plan the fall in May, under these circumstances, was basically a hopeless uh, enterprise in a way because um, we had to. We didn't know what would going to be, what really would be going uh, to happen in uh, November, December. And so, our chains of communication from October, November, December were completely disrupted. And if you analyze those uh, in, uh, after the fact, then you notice you meet people that you spend a whole day with in Turin, and you meet the same people and spend another day with in London. And then slowly things start to develop and you can plan uh, 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 works that they can acquire, etc. 
and then there is a crescendo in my, in, in, um, in Miami Beach, and um, that all wasn't existing anymore. These, these, these chains broke down, and I think particularly larger galleries who are uh, in the circuit were hit the hardest at the end of the year, while they had already developed a plan how to act for January and further on. So mm -hmm. I really have to say from my experience over two months, which were not good last year, uh, there was a lot to be learned. What was happening in Germany is very different from other countries. We were able to reorganize the uh, communication between the cultural ministry and the gallery uh, association. And we, first of all, got 19 million to spend on art exhibitions to, for galleries um, in June last year. And now uh, I would think that the larger galleries have uh, all gotten somewhere between 400,000. 500,000 compensation for their losses of the uh, end of the year. So um, the rest of the question, how is everybody else doing? I can't really tell you, but I think everybody is doing better than you thought you would think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would like, uh, Pablo, I know that your field of action is different, but nevertheless, I would like to ask you, how, what is your relation to the art fairs, to galleries, art institutions? And also with the artists, the artists you collect, yes. uh, what are the criteria for you to include, to make acquisitions? And also what is the relation with the, with the artists you have as a collector? Of course, of course. Uh, well, uh, you know, I've, I, I haven't been part of the, let's call it traditional art world uh, uh, before uh, I started really venturing into this. But uh, throughout my family, throughout my wife, uh, who's an architect and a designer, you know, we've always had art very, very present in our lives. And every time we travel, always museums, we've been to numerous art fairs and uh, you know we are we're not professional we weren't professionals of the of the space but certainly around um you know the, the relationship uh, and then uh, apologies i want to correct you with something that you said before i'm also personally not here for the monetary component i have no interest in that and we can discuss that uh, if you want later but uh, the relationship that i have with the artist is 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 is, is one that i think it's is the new form of, of patronage in, in in many ways um I, uh, I like to to get to ups to meet personally uh, uh, very deeply the artists that I engage with, and I, I, I like to get behind the, the whole careers. It's very unlikely that I'll, I will uh, pick a, a particular work uh, because uh, because I like it, but really I want to understand how that work fits within the career of the artist, uh, how is it innovating and adding to what uh, uh, that artist was doing before. And um, I, I, I try to be alongside in everything, absolutely everything uh, with the career. Uh, that is not the creative process. So so uh, the mechanics of distribution, uh, talking to other collectors, um, the dates, uh, the prices, uh, all of these things around uh, of the distribution, um, around the around the different uh, around, around the different careers of the artist, uh, 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 is what I try to, uh, to to be alongside. It's been a extraordinarily fascinating, uh, particularly in this field where. Uh, many of the creators were immensely talented, uh, but maybe maybe they didn't have the chance uh, before to to distribute their works because the technology didn't allow. And we can we can we can delve into that as a little bit as well. Uh, um, you know, many of them they also have to be entrepreneurs. The rules of the game um, are a little bit different uh, because of the direct distribution to collectors and because of the royalty components. That relationship between the creator and the collector uh, is is really uh, intensified and becomes uh, you know it's 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 a source of Friendship and um, I, um, you know, all these these artists and creators uh, uh, are immensely talented, uh, and you know, I think that there's still some role for other entities or other people uh, to help uh, and push their careers forward. Uh, so that's what we try to do. Mm -hmm. We come back a little bit later to, mm -hmm. to this aspect because we will, we, we can compare and see how how these two two formats can merge. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, because we want to analyze here how uh, what is the future of the art fairs or the challenges, mm -hmm. uh, let's not forget that art fairs are markets, but there are also places of encounter. They are is a professional uh, playground, let's say, is a is the moment of interaction between the different agents, the different uh, um, the different agents that take part in the in the art system. Mm -hmm. And in this urgency to define how the art fairs will be, uh, there are in front of us already different scenarios, no? Can be that the, on the one hand, can be that only the most powerful or, or 
well-funded uh, fairs can survive. On the other, that they may need to resize and also be more specialized, more differentiated, can be another option. Uh, I would like to address this question, especially to, to Thomas, uh, as a gallerist, how he sees, and as a Melanie, to, to uh, kind of analyst of, of this uh, sector also, how they see. Uh, Thomas, how, how, what is the possible scenarios you can imagine for the art fairs? As you say, they are extremely important as uh, uh, um, places where you uh, where you meet and the places where you discover. The discovery is something that is very different from anything that is at the moment offered by in, by by uh, digital uh, means. Uh, uh, you, uh, if you see the uh, way that the art fairs in general have reacted digitally, then that is just really not good at all. And you are you just can't get the information more or less and you're not helped with anything. There is no uh, 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 algorithm that will help you to discover if you like this, you go there, whatever. So um, in terms of that, there is, um, I would say they will need to establish something that where they can have a platform over the year that is not just the location uh, uh, Madrid mm -hmm. and then, but over the year, something where you can turn to this platform, where that platform of article gives it, for instance, the intellectual quality that that fair here has. And at the same time, they manage to grow a community that can go to Arco as an identity in a certain way. That would, I think, would be the... Uh, answer to something that we have had encountered uh, before March last year, which were a lot of art fairs that we already said, but what I also have to say, the larger art fairs were homogeneous in a way that was like, there was almost indistinguishable. And mm -hmm. what you would say is like Art Basel, Hong Kong, Miami and Basel were like basically like shopping malls with uh, the large, uh, whatever, MGM is uh, 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 Hauser and Weird and whatever, uh, um, uh, big brands and uh, also a very unfair system in terms of uh, uh, everybody having to pay the same square meter price, mm -hmm. but some can make much more out of that. So uh, I think if I talk about Arco, it's a very good example for what can happen. And that interesting thing is Arco has been so detached digitally. I mean, they only have had a functioning website for about two years now. And at the same time, uh, what Carlos Uros has been creating here over 10 years uh, is a content-driven art fair that mm -hmm. is very regional and is able to reach out to bigger players through content and not economic uh, 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 greatness in a way. So um, if... Maribel and the, uh, the successor of Carlos Ross would be given the chance of develop this at, as an international platform with the content-oriented uh, work that they have been doing. And that would be an answer to how a fair should be uh, uh, working. So fairs have to, if you ask me, have to uh, form identities. Mm -hmm. well, no, I have to say something about this, about Arco specifically, because in, during many years, fulfill the lack of... Uh, artistic institutions and I remember in the 90s I saw for the first time a Thomas Hirschhorn installation yeah. in the booth of Chantal Crusel where there was not the institution who could host this kind of yeah. project so it was really an educational an educational field that fulfilled like yes 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 I would say that the problem of why uh, digital uh, affairs or digital uh, meetings have not really been there is because we have a content problem and somewhat of an infrastructure problem on the, on, on, on the other side. But the reality is that the engagement that you're seeing, at least in the last several months or the last year and a half or two years uh, from these virtual galleries is extraordinarily high, much higher than what I see uh, in, 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 in many of these uh, real-life uh, 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 places. The reality, though, is that, again, it's... 
uh, uh, it's perhaps more uh, uneducated or unsophisticated. Uh, there's a lot of content that perhaps is 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 is, is, is less uh, less quality. And 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 uh, but the reality is that people are seeking uh, to 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 get it, uh, to to live immersive experiences, art art related experiences in every regard mm -hmm. that they can. Again, the technology is evolving. We still have a lot of a lot of way to go. But I wouldn't discount uh, 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 the the emergence of of very high end. Uh, digital art fairs uh, uh, that compete uh, or at least add to the experience that we see in real life. Uh, as we move to a digitally native world where everything really becomes digital and digital, the new generations, the new the new people that are entering the space feel extraordinarily comfortable uh, with mm -hmm. something like this. And and what digital generally digital fairs does is they they, they somewhat de democratize the access to uh, to the fairs. You can enter from everywhere. They usually have a, sl a slightly lower price. You can come at different times. There's always people around. I again, I, I certainly wouldn't discount it, and I've been. I, I would like to invite you to some of the of the I guess events fairs that that, that we host on this side of the spectrum, and uh, and uh, and I think you'll be you'll be extraordinarily surprised. Yeah. But I perfectly agree with you. I mean, yeah. that's that what 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 the static format that you have here, but has, but at the same time, the very human format that it has needs to be translated. So uh, uh, we already know how the. Uh, 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 behavior of our clients has uh, been over the last year and a half. So, I mean, there is this art and tech report that just came out and that shows you that the Instagram is one of the biggest selling uh, 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 sales tools uh, these mm -hmm. days or purchasing tools. And uh, where with people also, 60% of the people who buy, they're buying directly without having seen something. And so... What I'm saying, I perfectly agree with you, and uh, uh, I would say that's what they have to learn here. You know, but if what 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 can you expect of a fair organization that does not give its prime art fair, one of the best fairs that products that it has, an access to uh, 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 digital communication by giving it an ex a website, while Art Basel has had a website that was very well designed for a long time, and a clear identity. This fair actually has had the problem of having to recruit new uh, uh, um, graphic concepts every two years. I mean, it's like a completely unheard of thing in a, in a, in a world where you have to uh, form an identity. Mm -hmm. So uh, I agree with you. And this is where we, all of this has to merge in a, in a, in a certain way. Your end has to get more quality. Yes. And our end has, we have to, has to become more communicative in the way you see it. And again, what you have been saying, that there is a more democratic access for talents into the market. I understand that that uh, what you call the uh, uh, smart contract thinking in your uh, aspect, etc. But that might end up also being a free world at first, and and then the world of the successful at the end, where some people are the Georg Baselitzes of the digital uh, art, and some people will never make it, and they they will miss the gatekeepers that they have today. So that all of that has to. I, I was actually mentioning that more on the, I, on I agree, the, on the yeah, customers or the people that experience the art fair rather than the artists, but, yeah. it's, but it's, it's perfectly true and it's actually the, the one of the small issues that we have with the ecosystem. It's you know it's very open to everybody, but then the content obviously uh, uh, um, uh, suffers a bit. But there's uh, the good news is that that is changing. Uh, thankfully, a lot of a lot of actually established art uh, galleries, a lot of established uh, top tier uh, uh, creators, and many of the big collectors globally. Are really looking at this at this space and, and bringing together solutions uh, 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 that are, I think are going to be very professional, very well put together, and really uh, are bringing the best things from the traditional art world and, and utilizing the technology that we have available now. Uh, on this note, uh, soon I'll be releasing something. Uh, it's called Arist, uh, if everybody wants to see it. But uh, I'll be releasing something that I think uh, uh, will help with this. Um, yeah. Okay, Melanie, I don't want that the distance have made you yes, <laughs> away of this talk. <laughs> so I will put the two things together, the two questions. Uh, the, the evolution of the art fairs, I mean, how you see what are the possibilities, and also this permeability between the digital and the, and the analogic world. Yes, I mean, I agree, I agree with, with aspects of what everyone has said, actually. I think that what digital is not going away and we don't want it to. I mean, it's making a huge difference and the art world was quite slow to, to, to leap on it. Um, it's not just, it's not just fairs. 
and it will make a huge, huge difference. But I do also agree with what Thomas just said that in a way, having there's so much of everything, the more you have, the more democracy there is, actually, the more need there is for a structure around it. And, and you know, you mentioned people in your introduction, but, you know, people is a success because he went through an auction house, which is a, an old structure, you know, hundreds of years old. Um, and you talk about NFT art fairs or digital art fairs, but they're still art fairs. So it is, there is a permeability. And I think that, that for good reason, it's why I'm in a job. It's why Thomas is in a job because you need some editing of the, of the, of the all the information out there. Um, but I do, you know, I do also agree. I think it's worth bearing in mind how the, the business model needs to change for art fairs because the old model of the more galleries I get, the more revenue I get has stopped working for a variety of reasons. But as you mentioned, the environmental reasons earlier, um, Thomas mentioned, you know, how, how expensive this is for, you know, it's a different level for certain galleries and others. Um, and if that has to change, then fairs need to find a way to to make money. And everything that you're talking about when it comes to content, community and brand, that is how you make money because then you get sponsorship, then you get help. You have to differentiate yourself and you have to make a difference. I also just think, I think we shouldn't lose sight of art being a leisure activity as well and, and and yes obviously we can experience it online we can we can be efficient online and i agree as the improvements come and if you're digitally native why would you do it any other way but people i think and i hope still want to go outside they still want to see people in real life and, and art is a leisure activity and I, I so i think the two do need to exist together i did think the physical I hope the physical isn't completely going away. Even if it's just an experience you can photograph and put on Instagram, people still like to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think now is the point we could go a little bit deeper in the in the NFTs. And uh, I would like that you explain very basically what is the how can be applied to the art world, but also very interesting how they can. Uh, uh, facilitate or make easy some questions related to authorship that, for example, in the immaterial, the intangible artworks that we know it's a problem in performance, instructions. So I would like that you explain a little bit all these, all these aspects. Um, I'll try to be very, very brief, uh, uh, or try to simplify it as much as I can. But NFTs are really just a certificate of ownership, mm -hmm. of provenance, of history and an easy way for us to transact with digital items, in this case, uh, applied to art, but it could be applied to anything else. Mm -hmm. The reality is that for me, NFTs don't give any value at all mm -hmm. to the actual asset that is holding be that is held behind, uh, but they do facilitate a lot of, of these concepts. What I do like in particular about NFTs is that in general, because of how the technology works, they also allow for innovation in the way uh, uh, in the way artworks even 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 work, so you got you can get uh, generative artwork uh, that comes out of a of an actual economic transaction. Uh, you have a programmable art uh, that that also changes because of you, if you change a, a transaction or another transaction, you have. Um, you have uh, art that actually changes over time, uh, utilizing again the uh, concepts of, of of the blockchain to 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 affect those changes, and and uh, I I think it's 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 just fascinating. But I, I think it's very important for people to to separate the word art uh, with from NFTs. Uh, really, again, this is just the certificate, the technology that we used. Uh, but hopefully, as we as we move forward, and um, digital art uh, 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 becomes a part of art uh, rather than a small niche that is growing, but really part of art, just a different medium. I hope that, that people can understand that this is just a better way of, 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 of transacting and, and following and seeing provenance and... And, 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 and yeah. can it help to uh, to make that artists can really work and live from their work also, no, in a way? Yes, uh, this is this is uh, uh, true again, uh, and we'll see how this develops. I do have I do have my views uh, where I, I personally think that uh, the role of galleries 
uh, the role of, of museums, the role, the, the, the role of auction houses, the role of a lot of these um, uh, uh, players from the traditional world mm -hmm. are very important uh, for the maturity of the space. Uh, but there's two big changes, again, that, 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 that really change the, the life of the artists in this case and allows them to, I guess, regain part of the control, at, at least of the financials, where they, they have avenues to reach the, co the collector directly mm -hmm. uh, with no intermediaries and where they actually receive the large majority of the profits, a, a big difference with the traditional galleries. And then there's also the concept of, of royalties, no? where automatically um, if, you, uh, 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 if, if a collector purchases a work and then sells it uh, you know, a few later uh, for, 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 for any price, which I, I think this actually should change, but uh, they receive uh, generally the 10% uh, royalty. And, uh, and again, I think that, uh, you know, over time, uh, uh, this does help many of the art artists that actually enjoy part of uh, part of the success, either careers keep evolving, which I think is very positive mm -hmm. uh, and liberating. Yeah. There is one aspect, nevertheless, that is important when you say that the artist can connect directly to the collector, who is out of this uh, equation are the galleries, that the galleries, they, they are not only, they, they don't only sell, but they really accompany the artist during all their career and uh, help them to present the work in, a, in the right collections, in the right institutions, so they are working also for the history, for the memory of the art. Mm -hmm. And then in this equation, uh, so the, you, there is an institution, there is a, so who, who makes this role? Because the artist directly with the collector, I think there is something missing in uh, this uh, I, equation. I also believe it is missing and it's coming and you see that many of the successful artists on, from this side of the digital uh -huh. artists are, are actually in many ways partnering up or actually utilizing as well, getting together with galleries to, to showcase their careers. Uh, because again, all of the things these artists now need to not only be artists, but be entrepreneurs. Uh, and you know, in life, it's, 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 you need to specialize in things and uh, uh, we all grow together if we, if we go alongside the people that can add value. What I do think is that, uh, again, because this is available and because the rules of the game are somewhat change, are changing slightly and because artists are getting royalties, I think now they're in a position to to perhaps negotiate a little bit more uh, uh, in other stands or the or the or the mm -hmm. you know or the economics behind uh, their careers. Also, again, because this travels a lot cheaply, uh, a lot cheaper. Uh, digital art, you know, you can <laughs> it cost a few cents to to uh, in most cases a few cents to to move around. Uh, there's a lot of a lot less like cost involved with, with with just everything around the selling of the artworks and the communications and the art and and everything. Uh, I do think that perhaps the role is going to be uh, slightly redefined, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and yeah, I think uh, uh, the, the the economics is going to be uh, certainly altered. Mm -hmm. When I notice with the when all this uh, media coverage of the Beeple uh, salt in action and so on, and what I notice with this uh, with these kind of transactions is that. Um, the media, or some media, most of the media focus again on statistics, records, numbers of the, uh, the, the 90% of the clients who visit Christie's were new and 58% were millennials and the millions and so on. That this is also a problem that the art, uh, the system we know of art has because very too often the media is focus on the, the extraordinary, not in the sense of content, but in numbers, records, etc. So uh, how do you think we can solve uh, this situation? And I'm not talking about content, like, like Thomas uh, pointed out before. How do you think this, because in the end, this is a distance between art and society. Doesn't matter if it's digital, it is physical. And how do you think this gap can be, can be solved? Is, I address to any of you, and uh, I, I, I can. If you want, like, I, I don't think it's going to be solved. I think that's a human condition. The people are just sensationalist uh, headlines. Always, always, uh, uh, always draw more attention. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. is the way media operates uh, uh, today, and just human nature. So I don't think that's that's going to change. So what I do think is that little by little, we're still starting to see more professionals from the other side actually looking uh, 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 and deeper and doing some more analysis on what's happening here. And I think that's very positive, and we're starting to see more uh, proper articles, proper papers, uh, uh, and just documentaries, just general uh, information coming out that is focused on, on the innovation that is happening here versus the, the records that are being broken. Mm -hmm. 
I think also as, I a, think as a journalist, this is a subject that the headline. One moment, oh, we are too. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Me. Me, Melanie, go I ahead. just think, yes, sorry, as a journalist who is, you know, responsible for some of these headlines, I think in a way you can't have it both ways. Art actually, some art does cost a lot of money and people want to understand why. And in a way, while learning why, that actually helps expand art to other people. And maybe um, some people might say, no, it's not worth that. Well, it's a load of rubbish. And others might say, oh, I can see. And I think if you want... If you want this world to, to be main, more mainstream, and I think there, I think there is this permanent paradox. I actually, I think we're a very codependent industry. You know, Thomas talks about the artists. Absolutely, none of this exists without the artists. But everything around the artists also helps the artists to exist. And part of the beauty of the art world, I actually think, is this slight uh, contrast between commerce and art. I didn't think it's gonna. I didn't we're ever resolve it. Mm -hmm. Thomas? It's very difficult to, to even start analyzing that because what you have is uh, you have the problem of missing structure and mm -hmm. the, prob uh, 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 and the pro problem of overstructuredness. So if you look at the early 70s, for instance, you have a rebellion against structuredness, overstructuredness, and you go into unstructuredness. What it leaves at the end of the 70s is uh, not necessarily only a positive, uh, uh, but you find uh, uh, missing rules not necessarily uh, uh, creating better quality. So. My, I'm afraid that um, we are just basically seeing an explosion of something that is completely undefined and has no real merit. And that, that will be probably a tsunami that is covering everything that could be good in uh, uh, digital art. So we also are at the moment not really focusing on the fact that what we have achieved culture in terms of slowness is actually not being blown away by s speed and mass. So that is a problem of our culture. And you have to always see the way that all of this has developed over the last 30, 40 years is an exponential development that our mind has never seen. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, I don't know who is the judge here. I don't know who is going to decide what is good and what is bad. What is, what is, I am still looking for an answer to what artistic greatness is. Mm -hmm. What the real artistic greatness is. You cannot tell me that 15,000 free artists who can speak to everybody are better than all these people who are now starting all kinds of theories about why corona doesn't exist and that uh, you can put a, 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 a coin to your uh, a vaccination mm -hmm. spot and it will stick. I mean, that's where we are going. And I'm not saying this is the way the world develops. I can't, I can't help it. And we have to find a way that we can uh, 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 go into that. And I, and I think there are unbelievable artistic developments that you do not cover, unfortunately, which have to do with uh, uh, art and artificial intelligence, which is mind-blowingly interesting and mind-blowingly that has the beauty of what I said before uh, of mathematical space. And mathematical space is what we are actually living in now. Our virtual reality is mathematical space. And if art wants to achieve something, then it needs to somehow find an idea how to picture this mathematical space, this new space in which we are living. This will not be done by people's uh, fantasy art, because that is just the, a sign of helplessness in front of greatness that can't be achieved. I would like not, not to <laughs> miss the opportunity uh, to have this, uh, these three persons so knowledgeable that to invite uh, the audience to, to ask questions and address questions directly to them. So I don't know, I, I don't see very well in this part because of the light, but if, uh, if there is a question or comment. He, one, one second, uh, the microphone. Thank you. What do you guys think about the 
virtual galleries and things like the Central Land, well, especially you, Pablo. And do you think, because you know, uh, talking to a lot of like young people, even though like, I, I have kids, like my son who is like nine, ten years old, he's asking me like that. I heard about stuff like what is Dogecoin? Ah, it's not belonging to people, and and they they're all completely into virtual. They play games virtual, so I think that the growing generation will enjoy it a lot. So do you think that we'll see a, tra a transition of current, you know, a uh, gallery going into digital, you know, like and build these virtual spaces, or it will be like both? How do you see that part? Oh, I'm, uh, a hundred percent. I mean, it's already happening uh, all the time, not only in the central land, but in some in space, in a lot of these uh, uh, metaverse uh, uh, places. Uh, again, the engagement and activity that, and the interest that we see in these spaces is extraordinary. I can I can begin to explain everybody that can everybody can go and participate and can see, uh, you know, the amount of people that are uh, 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 that are really uh, uh, being engaged. Again, uh, in the case of the central in particular, uh, well, we, we certainly have a space there. Uh, uh, we are showcasing part of our collection there, but uh, I personally think that it's still lacking some functionalities and, and maybe some of the aesthetics associated with maybe a, a, a very high end uh, immersive experience particularly in relation to art. Uh, I like some in space for this better. Uh, um, and I think that very, very soon we're going to start seeing more and more of these uh, worlds that allow you to, to really bring these experiences that, again, for me, are in many cases much better than the traditional counterparts of uh, a few white walls with... Uh, uh, with some works on them. So absolutely, this is happening. A lot of the galleries, a lot of the auction houses uh, uh, have uh, 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 spaces here and, uh, and it will continue to evolve. I'm not entirely sure if it will always happen through the metaverse uh, or I don't want to get too technical with the, here with the, with the concept of the metaverse, but uh, it certainly will happen through the, uh, through the virtual means. Um, Again, a lot of galleries, of known galleries, and Sotheby's has a, a very big, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 um, gallery space in in the central land that is that is, you know, frequented by a lot, a lot of people all the time. Yeah. Another question. Hi, I I also have a question which I'm directing to Pablo, but if Thomas or Melanie are happy to reply to me, I'm happy to hear you as well. Um, I was wondering what's the role of curators in crypto art, how it changed, if it changed from physical art and how do you see it, where do you see it going? Yeah, so uh, uh, up until now, unfortunately, there has not been a lot of curation in the space and it's, in my opinion, the, the single biggest problem uh, that we have in the ecosystem. You have, uh, you know, uh, uh, an incredible pool of, of, of an explosion of talent, talent happening that is being lost again by the uh, commoditization uh, uh, democratization of, of, of art and and, 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 uh, and curation is much, much, it's very, very, very much needed. Uh, this is something uh, that I think uh, a little bit later is evolving because, again, the, the, the better creators or the top creators uh, are, are coming alongside curators and are seeing the results of a properly executed, properly presented, properly uh, uh, thought, uh, uh, thoughtful, uh, 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 you know, collection or release. Uh, and I think uh, that little by little we're starting to see uh, a lot more. In, in my case in particular, I am again building infrastructure for the space and this is our, our number one priority. Uh, our curation team is uh, 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 top, top, top at the global scale and I think it's going to add a lot of quality, a lot of professionalism and a lot of maturity to the market. Uh, hopefully more and more uh, players really start taking this a little bit more seriously. Yeah. I, I think your optimism is fantastic that there is so much uh, quality and so much talent in the world and that there are all these one thousands and thousands of undiscovered uh, 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 super talented artists can go into the, you know I've been doing nothing my whole life since I'm 18 by being in the art world I'm what you could call a fish in the water who doesn't know what the water is but what I know is these artists don't exist that you think of and if you have been in as many committees as I have been, and if you have looked at as many artists as I have over the last 40 years, you will find that there is just a lot of stuff that is being copied. There is a lot of mild thinking. And if you want to go to any restaurant and hear people talk about philosophy and hear what kind of bullshit they are talking about in comparison to the original ideas of whoever, Kant or whatever, then you have what you call uh, immensely talented millions of artists. Yeah, I mean, you can sell that to a public who doesn't know anything anymore. That's okay. And then we have a, 
huge market that will believe anything and doesn't even know about Velazquez, who doesn't even know about Miro, who doesn't know about Picasso, who just doesn't know about a past where art has had a function of actually being a mythical quality that would uh, uh, touch people and that people would group around. So that's, uh, that's, the, big, uh, 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 that's the big problem here. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I'm sorry. I'm not against what you're doing, but it's a. Uh, I, I somewhat agree with it. Obviously, the more knowledge, the more history, the more you know about something, the more you can uh, 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 you can push that 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 forward. And I do agree that again, there's a lot of uh, in this space, uh, uh, a lot of uh, perhaps not as high quality or or developed uh, 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 works coming on. What I would the only thing that I would disagree here is that I do think. That this technology has allowed for 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 again the distribution of digital art, which is not new. It's something that has been brewing for decades now. Uh, uh, we just now have the ability to transact with it, and and again, as we move into the digital native world, we're going to see a lot more young artists expressing themselves like this. I do think that in this big sea of perhaps not so high quality, we're going to find. Uh, what I think are going to be the, the the most important artists or creators of our of our generation, or at least of my generation, uh, uh, and that I think that uh, there's no reason to think that many of these cannot utilize this medium uh, and be as important or more than any of the top tier contemporary artists today. Um, uh, uh, again, uh, maybe I understand uh, uh, you might not like or you might not respect uh, Beeple uh, in particular, but Beeple is just one individual here, which by the way, I think he's extraordinarily good at what he does. But um, 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 uh, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of talent coming in the space uh, uh, from people like... Um, you know, Andre Reisinger, who, who would be a, an extraordinary artist in the traditional world as well. People like Refika Nadol, uh, that is utilizing all sorts of innovation and the mastery of many, many fields to bring together artistic immersive experiences. Uh, you have people like Pac, that is innovating on the mathematical realm, on the conceptual art, on, the, you know, bringing together as well what I think are aesthetically pleasing and innovative works. You have you have a lot of these of these artists that uh, uh, that I really think are going to mark a a a a a dent in in the history of art, uh, and um, and that are as qualified uh, or more than, than than many of the physical artists that we have today. Yeah, and I think that there will be there, there are possibilities. I mean, I represent an artist who's called Fabian Marcaccio, who is uh, from Argentina, lives in New York, who has very early on started to do exactly. Uh, uh, what you are thinking about on a very, very high level. We have very little ways of uh, marketing that. So that would be an artist who would come from the high end uh, into that. I think that there should be a forum for people who are much more high end thinking, like the artificial intelligence artists that I've been talking about, who really create particular spaces now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another question? Sí. Uh, un poco. Eh, es un poco, eh, creo que entiendo a Tomás eh, en su manera de ver, yo soy una persona también que lleva 41 años en el mercado del arte, o sea, nací en esto, y lo que, nos, lo que a mí me sorprende, que debe sorprenderle a Tomás, son los precios que se pagan por las obras digitales, cuando nosotros encontramos todo un mercado y un trabajo que han hecho las galerías con otros artistas, y que realmente vemos la diferencia. Eso es algo que, que, que yo tengo también muchas preguntas. Pero también me hace pensar que el arte en los últimos años ha sido un validador de muchas cosas. O sea, yo vengo de una familia donde mi padre era coleccionista y él compraba arte y decía que no era coleccionista. Hoy, el campo que estamos viviendo hoy Estamos llenos de coleccionistas, todo el mundo quiere ser coleccionistas. Los grandes personajes o personalidades que tienen un poder adquisitivo quieren ser parte del mundo del arte porque los valida. Entonces yo pregunto si todas estas criptomonedas o NFT, si realmente no lo están utilizando el arte para validar las monedas. Esa es una pregunta que se verá después. También... Organizo tres ferias de arte. Vengo, Melanie, eh, mi padre había fundado una revista que se llama Arte al Día en Argentina. Participo de la Feria Arco del año 82. Entonces, conozco muy bien el mundo periodístico. Y terminé yo organizando además tres ferias de arte. 
una en Argentina que se llama Buenos Aires Foto, Ferias Chicas, una en Perú que se llama Park, Perú Arte Contemporáneo, y otra en Miami que es Pinta Miami, que es Pinta New York, que la, que la llevé a Miami. Realmente también yo me pregunté cuando vino el mundo de la pandemia, escuchaba las galerías que decían no se puede tener más ferias, o sea, estamos cansados de las ferias, muchos viajes, ok, vino la pandemia y las ferias tuvieron que cortar. Y hoy estamos todos desesperados por volver, no por volver a todas las ferias, pero por volver al arte, a, la, a las ferias presenciales, lo estamos viendo en arco, o sea, los que venimos más a la feria son los que amamos y los que necesitamos del arte. Por eso uno se toma el avión y se arriesga. Otros se quedarán en sus casas. Pero yo me preguntaba, ¿seguiremos? ¿Qué pasará? Pero la, yo creo, pensé en un momento que la escena de las ferias se iban a derrumbar. Y me estoy dando cuenta que en Miami, donde yo vivo, que hay 15 o 17 ferias, las ferias más importantes, porque no, no hablo de lo más importante, no hablo de Art Basel. Art Basel es un monstruo, es una gran feria, maneja todo el mercado mundial. Pero hablemos de Untitled, hablemos de, de Nada, hablemos de Pulse. Hay un montón de ferias que todas están funcionando y todas están preparándose en Miami para diciembre, que va a ser una gran fiesta porque en Miami se está viviendo otro mundo muy diferente al que estamos viendo nosotros. La pregunta es... ¿Por qué están? Porque realmente hay muchas galerías, muchos artistas y muchos más compradores que había hace 30 años. Entonces, esas son las cosas. Y con respecto a lo digital, es, creo que es una plataforma que vino, que vino para quedarse, porque realmente nos va a amplificar los que organizamos ferias, las plataformas online, porque lo que sí creo que va a cambiar con el tema de la pandemia es que la gente va a viajar menos. O sea, yo vivía arriba de un avión, no quiero viajar tanto, uh -huh. pero quiero ir a las ferias y disfrutarlas más. Y, y el hecho de estar en una plataforma, vamos a tener la posibilidad que nuestros coleccionistas o la gente que está siguiendo una galería lo pueda ver y pueda comprar. Eh, bueno, Nada más. Eh, muchas gracias. Yo tengo unas preguntas más para Pablo que después te quiero hacer. So was an observation more than a question. <laughs> Thank you very gracias. much. Okay, so I think it's the time to to really uh, close this talk that is not closed, but we open <laughs> up <laughs> many <laughs> many lines. But uh, it's, it's the idea was to analyze in real time uh, what are the possible scenarios. So I think you very, very much, Melanie, Thomas, Pablo, for sharing all your experiences and to have this this Thank rich you. dialogue with you and to the audience for accompanying us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.